Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6073 in the name of Fiona Hislop on recognise and celebrate Edinburgh's international festivals in their 70th anniversary year. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the motion. Ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name. And I'm delighted to open this debate to recognise and celebrate Edinburgh's international festivals in their 70th year. In 1947, conductor Rudolf Bing co-founded the festival with Henry Harvey Wood, head of the British Council, and Sidney Newman, professor of music at Edinburgh University, along with civic leaders, most notably Sir John Faulkner, who spoke of his ambition that the festival should provide a platform for the flowering of the human spirit. In the aftermath of the devastation brought about by World War II, arts and culture were seen as a, a pivotal means to reimagine a new and better world. And Bing's vision to establish a festival programme of an ambitious and varied character, and above all, be in a city that would embrace the opportunity to make the festival a major preoccupation, not just with the city chambers, but in the heart and home of citizens." End of quote. How prophetic his words were. And the impact of the first festival resonated across the city and around the world, enabling Edinburgh to become the world's leading festival city and a catalyst for the formation of Edinburgh's family of festivals. 1947 was the founding year of the Film and Fringe Festivals. And alongside the International Festival, a programme of documentaries were presented by the Edinburgh Film Guild. The Edinburgh International Film Festival is now the world's oldest continually running film festival. It bursts into life next week, uh, exploring identity in the context of our shifting political and cultural changes, uh, showcasing 151 features from 46 countries and expanding, expanding into other arts venues in the city. Eight theatre companies uh, arrived in Edinburgh uh, and could not participate in the Edinburgh Festival back in 1947, so they sought out smaller alternative venues for their productions. The Fringe was born and is now the world's largest art festival, this year featuring nearly 3,400 shows in 300 venues with 62 countries represented. An open access festival where no one is denied entry, making it the largest platform on earth for artistic freedom. Ten years ago, Festivals Edinburgh was created to act as a strategic organisation to focus on overarching areas of mutual interest. Its sole focus is to maintain the festival's global competitive edge, and I applaud how well this has been done. They support the festivals from behind the scenes, all the partners, the agents, the artists, the producers, the politicians that descend into the city. And I'm particularly impressed by Festival's Edinburgh Momentum programme, which brings uh, international delegations to view work, to share knowledge and to deepen relationships. In 2007, uh, former MSP Kenny McCaskill and I, as Lothian MSPs, uh, recognised the need to provide more support and opportunity for Scotland's artists uh, at the Edinburgh Festivals. And from a 2007 manifesto commitment, the Festival's Expo Fund was born to promote the creation of new work and international appreciation of work from Scotland. Since 2008, the Scottish Government's Expo Fund has provided £19 million to members of Festivals Edinburgh. It's pivotal in supporting the best of our cultural heritage, showcasing contemporary innovation and generating ambitious collaborations. And it has enabled the creation of a legacy of important new work, which promotes and maximises the opportunities for the best of Scotland's artists on an international platform. It has built innovation across the festivals, raises the international profile and exposure of our creativity. And the Expo funding made in Scotland has enabled 159 companies, ensembles and artists to showcase their work, with a further 57 productions touring across five continents, visiting over 20 countries. The James Plays, which many of you may have seen, presented at the International Festival in 2015, toured in Adelaide, Auckland, Canada, and across the UK, receiving critical acclaim, winning the Evening Standard Award in 2016. And the fund has enabled the film festival to nurture and develop new talent in the sector through Talent Lab. And every one of our Edinburgh International Festivals have received funding to develop and enhance their unique programmes and support artists working in Scotland. 
This year, the Scottish Government provided an additional £300,000 of extra funding to celebrate the 70th anniversary through three remarkable and unique pieces of work. The 70th year was launched with a uh, spectacular midnight moment as part of Edinburgh's Hogmanay, supported um, uh, by £90,000 from Expo, and it drew the eyes of the world to this momentous occasion. And the Scottish Government supports World Fringe Day on the 11th of July, which recognises the importance of all the fringes across the world. 2017 isn't just the 70th anniversary of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, it's the anniversary of the whole fringe concept. And 1947 was the catalyst to ignite a global network of fringes, with more than 200 across the world today. Fringe festivals transcend national boundaries, create networks, collaborations, friendships, debates and discussion. So the Scottish Government's second supported uh, international festival celebration event illustrates the concept of the flourishing of the human spirit I referred to earlier through Bloom, a, a complex and strikingly beautiful night garden brought to life through illuminations and 3D mapping. And the third project is currently being developed by the Edinburgh Film Science and Children's Festivals, and that will be announced at a later date. And in reference to the Conservative Amendment, uh, the Scottish Government has been a strong supporter and fully engaged in the development of the pro proposed impact performance venue since my initial conversations back in 2013, uh, when I met with the donors and the Royal Bank of Scotland. We saw great value in the proposal, and I took the subsequent decision to fund the initial feasibility study conducted by the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. Since then, we've been in discussion with partners involved in the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal to secure their support for the venue. And I'm pleased that these negotiations have progressed to this stage, with the UK Government now confirming its support. This project will secure a critical new performance venue in the centre of Edinburgh, provide a home for the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, and be used exclusively for festival performances in August. And the economic and cultural inclusion benefits of such a venue will be felt widely across Edinburgh and its surrounding regions. Um, and to reach out across Scotland to build new audiences to embrace a variety of musical genres. So in the face of increasing national and international competition, this support will opt optimise Edinburgh's position as an international festival city and Scotland's reputation as a leading centre for music and the performing arts and be truly transformational for a wide range of communities in terms of reach, innovation, quality and impact. So I welcome the spirit of the amendment, look forward to concluding the city deal details with the UK government when they are ready to restart discussions. And of course, the festivals have many funders and partners, which include Creative Scotland, Events Scotland, Visit Scotland, the City of Edinburgh Council and the British Council, trusts, foundations, public and private philanthropists and audiences from Edinburgh and beyond. And this collectively enables our festivals to be the best in the world. The economic contribution of the festival was underlined in the 2015 Edinburgh Festival's Impact Study, where the festivals are recognised as a, a world-leading brand, reporting audiences of a staggering 4.5 million. That's on a par with the FIFA World Cup and only second to the Olympics. The festivals act as an economic powerhouse and they generate an economic impact of £280 million in Edinburgh and £313 million in Scotland in total. Yesterday, a uh, presiding officer saw the launch of The Spirit of 47 strand within the International Festival. It's curated uh, with the British Council and it presents a rich global programme to examine the way culture connects us across borders and divisions and perhaps Lewis MacDonald in moving his amendment will reflect on, on this aspect. Their new European songbook project brings together respected European musicians with non-EU artists who have made their home in Europe during the recent wave of migration. Festivals support the, the seamless flow of artists from Europe and other nations to ensure that Edinburgh can maintain their international position. And we're going to have to work hard to ensure that the festivals are not debilitated or disadvantaged by Brexit. The festivals support our thriving and fast-growing cultural sector in Scotland, and one that relies on creative people building skills, expertise and knowledge through exchange and dialogue with others. And so access to ideas the talent, the experiences and the creative exchanges which freedom of movement provides is essential to enable all our industries to flourish and thrive uh, and including, the, importantly, our festivals. And that must be part of the reconsidered Brexit by the UK government. So, President Officer, the festivals are distinctly Scottish yet profoundly international, drawing artists, audiences and media from every continent with more than 70 countries attending each year. 
Edinburgh's festivals define and promote Scotland's identity as a confident, creative and welcoming nation. They support our international outlook by providing cultural platforms, forums for national and international debate. And last year, the Scottish Government engaged with representatives from 27 nations during August. Individual countries choose Edinburgh to host their own show showcases. And this year, we'll welcome Canada, South Australia, Ireland, India, and many more. And the festival's challenges enable us all to step out of our own lives, to experience something new and unique. They bring people together to germinate new ideas. They help us understand other cultures and other experiences. They celebrate human expression in all its guises of sorrow, laughter, joy, and beauty. So in closing, presiding officer, I urge Parliament to come together to recognise the outstanding contribution of the Edinburgh International Festivals and what they contribute to Scotland and the world and pay tribute to the passion, the commitment and talent of all the artists and audiences that have contributed to a remarkable 70 years. Thank you very much. And I now call on Gordon Lindhurst to speak to and move Amendment 6073.1. A very flexible seven minutes, Mr Lindhurst. I'm obliged, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, as an MSP representing the Lothian region, it gives me great pleasure to be opening this debate today for the Scottish Conservatives. Today, we recognise the extraordinary success of Edinburgh's international festivals in their 70th year. The festivals have gone from strength to strength, with growing numbers of visitors attracted to Edinburgh each summer and an ever-increasing number of festivals. The city of Edinburgh, and indeed Scotland, has shown that Rudolf Bing, the man originally credited with bringing the festival to the city in 1947, knew what he was doing. Even he might have been surprised to see how many events now take place every year. In just a few weeks, Edinburgh will take the lead in celebrating the international success of the festivals with World Fringe Day on the 11th of July. Over 200 open access events will take place in cities from Edinburgh to as far afield as Australia, reflecting not only on how successful Edinburgh has been as an international festival leader, but how popular the appeal of the fringe model now is across the globe. Another year of events will then begin with the international festival itself, the fringe festival, film festival, jazz and book festivals, to name but a few. Not to forget what is often seen as the real jewel in the crown at Edinburgh Castle itself, the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Now this is an extremely popular event which has been attended by many of the people of Edinburgh and which I myself have attended on occasions. And as I and others are aware, obtaining tickets can be quite an art in itself. And that for an event that has been running since 1950. Any member in the chamber who has yet to experience the thrill of the tattoo is well advised to do so, but to buy your tickets early. Deputy Presiding Officer, as a resident of Edinburgh who works, as we all do here, at the foot of Scotland's Royal Mile, I will not be the only one to have to struggle to walk to the top of the High Street during July and August. However, as an advocate working in the courts behind St Giles Cathedral, I had many years of even more direct experience of this. Now, I well remember a colleague of mine who shall remain nameless, uh, having been pursued down the high street by a street artist waving a pair of underpants, shouting after him, sir, you've forgotten your briefs. <laughs> and as you will know, briefs is the name for counsel's uh, instructions from solicitors. So we were all highly amused at that. That incident was perhaps only bettered by hordes of teenage girls pursuing a number of junior advocates dressed as they were in morning dress in various directions from the corner of St. Giles Cathedral. Uh, as we found out, the occasion was the rumor that Robbie Williams had purchased a flat in the newly refurbished former corner court building behind St. Giles. The girls mistook various advocates for Robbie Williams Butler whom they pursued in the hope of meeting Robbie himself, until they realized in utter disappointment that there were too many of us for that to be true. So comedy indeed provided in real time. But the people of Edinburgh take great pride in welcoming all who come to experience our comedy, real life or otherwise. 
Whatever the apparent inconveniences, 89% of local people who attend the festivals acknowledge that the yearly event increases people's pride in their own city. It is quite staggering that in 2015, there were over 4.5 million attendees, bringing a value of some £280 million for our economy in Edinburgh and £313 million for Scotland as a whole. Both of these were substantial increases on the figures recorded five years earlier in 2010. May I also acknowledge the role that the 25,000 or so performers and entertainers play in making the Edinburgh International Festivals what they are. While we very often think of the household names that grace the stage of the Edinburgh International Conference Centre with sold out gigs evening by evening, we should also congratulate others who may not benefit financially in the same way from the festivals, but who nevertheless come to Edinburgh to do what they do best. They perform in the melting pot of the good, the bad, and we must admit it, sometimes ugly shows amongst the festival. Some spend literally thousands of pounds of their own money, much of which may never be recouped on traveling to Edinburgh, hiring out venues, and putting on their show. Without them, we would not be here today, speaking about the success of the Edinburgh International Festivals. Edinburgh is an important gateway to our country, and the Edinburgh Festival's 2015 impact study, published obviously last year, showed us that visitors to the festivals are now spending more nights elsewhere in Scotland, out with Edinburgh, than they were five years ago. Deputy Presiding Officer, despite the political and economic challenges facing our country, figures for festival attendances remain buoyant, with fringe ticket sales up by over 7% in 2016. Meanwhile, overseas tourists to Scotland continue to rise at ever-increasing rates. We saw a 6% increase in overseas tourist numbers, accompanied by a 9% increase in tourist spending last year alone. Now, much of that increase was down to North American tourists, showing that Edinburgh and wider Scotland as destinations matter more than distance or other factors in a tourist decision on where to travel. It is to be welcomed that both the Scottish and UK governments continue to support Edinburgh and its festivals. As we celebrate this 70th anniversary, I am pleased that the Scottish Government has provided additional funds. Support for the development of the new Edinburgh Concert Hall through the proposed Edinburgh City deal already referred to uh, with the UK government's support will hopefully not only reinforce Edinburgh's role as a world leading festival city, but will be a leading centre for music and the performing arts. This proposed hall will continue to draw eminent musicians, actors and other performers from across the globe into the city throughout the year, ensuring that Edinburgh, a city with a great artistic tradition and heritage, maintains its continuous exchange of creative talent, not just in August, but for all 12 months of the year. And I'm pleased to say that the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the Labour Amendment in the name of Lewis MacDonald, which echoes those sentiments, as well as the Scottish Government's own motion. Deputy Presiding Officer, I look forward to today's debate and move the amendment in my name. I now call on Lewis MacDonald to speak to and move Amendment 6073.2. A generous five minutes, please, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. Seventy years on, Presiding Officer, and there is indeed much to celebrate. The Edinburgh Festivals have achieved truly global status. Hundreds of venues providing a stage for thousands of artists, performing to a combined audience of hundreds of thousands, and generating millions in benefits to the Scottish economy. Visitors in great numbers from around the United Kingdom, from Europe and around the world, all contributing to Edinburgh as a world city and putting Scotland firmly on the map for the whole range of performing arts and, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, for film as well. Any anniversary celebration should, of course, start with where things stood when this all began. The Edinburgh festivals were created as an act of policy following one of the most traumatic episodes in human history. The Second World War, like the first, was hugely destructive of people and places. It also witnessed an all-out assault on the shared values of human civilization. It witnessed systematic genocide and vast impoverishment. 
a time of darkness, austerity and division. Post-war Labour government recognised the need to light beacons of hope in such a time. The creation of Edinburgh as an international festival city was one of the fruits of that policy, a policy shared uh, by all uh, in public life in Scotland at the time. And the, the truth which the festival symbolised then was that the best answer to barbarism is to strengthen and celebrate civilization, to meet destruction with creativity, to promote hope, compassion and unity against those who would spread hatred, division and fear. That is what makes these festivals truly world events, not just where people come from, but also what the festivals themselves represent. And we know only too well that hatred, division and fear are stalking the world again today. The same terrorists who sponsored murder in London and Manchester have committed outrages around the world, not least in destroying the physical evidence of human civilizations in the Middle East. And just as the Edinburgh festivals lit a beacon of hope after the Second World War, so the great get-together this weekend will be a direct answer to the forces of hatred which killed Joe Cox a year ago, marking uh, the anniversary of her death and making it an occasion to celebrate our shared civilization and our shared values. The spirit of 47 then is as important now as it was 70 years ago. And I'm looking forward to the 10 day festival within a festival later this year, which the cabinet secretary mentioned under the title Spirit of 47, featuring music and theater, dance and debate around that internationalist and multicultural theme. Joining all of these art forms with debate and discussion goes to the heart of what Edinburgh's festivals are about. And I'm certain the experience will be entertaining and inspiring and enlightening. Because the festivals have, of course, gone from success to success, perhaps exceeding even their founders' wildest dreams. The number of festivals has multiplied, the size of the audiences has grown, and the impact has extended well beyond the city itself to benefit every area in Scotland. The scale of the festivals each and every year, as the Cabinet Secretary also said, puts them in the same league as the Olympic Games and the FIFA World Cup. Success, of course, always brings its own challenges. And success in this case means that the festivals now matter more, uh, or for, for more, than simply their cultural excellence. They are also vitally important to the tourism sector and to the Scottish economy as a whole. And that is why public funding here is not just right in principle, it is in the public interest in a material sense too. I welcome the Scottish Government's Expo Fund and the initiatives that it supports. I look forward to hearing uh, more about the Pop-Up Family Festival, for example, which I know uh, will be uh, visiting parts of Scotland later this year. But it is important uh, to acknowledge that continuing public funding remains part of the recipe for success of the Edinburgh International Festivals and must never be taken for granted. I looked again this week at Thundering Hooves 2, the 10-year strategy to sustain the success of Edinburgh's festivals, which was published in May 2015. That strategy was supported by all the main stakeholders in the festivals, local and national, including the Scottish Government, and its main findings still hold good today. It highlighted the risk to the festivals of cuts in local authority funding in particular, and it concluded that large-scale radical solutions are now needed to replace eroding public funding, and these must include potential alternative funding models, even if they present their own constraints. Now, the festivals are not seeking in any way to live off public subsidies. Uh, the International Festival, for example, grew its earned income from fundraising and ticket sales by 46% between 2009 and 2016, at the same time as grant income went down by 4%. The festivals are more than ready to help themselves. But what public funding enables the festivals to do is to plan ahead and to invest for future productions with some degree of certainty and without depending entirely on current cash flows uh, for investment to grow their future audiences. Now, I know that the Cabinet Secretary understands that point, and I hope that from today she will continue to engage with all the festivals and with Edinburgh City Council in exploring potential funding solutions for the future. If that is done creatively and constructively, the next 70 years can be as productive and as exciting as the last. And I move the amendment in my name. Uh, we now uh, move to the open debate. Can, can I say to all members present that I have quite a bit of time in hand? So if members wish to wax lyrical, I'm quite relaxed about that. And also to give extra time for uh, interventions and a bit of discussion if members would feel that useful. So
So, <laughs> can I go to Joan McAlp and please to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Edinburgh Festival's impact study points out that the 4.5 million combined audiences of the Edinburgh Festival puts them on a par with the FIFA World Cup. And in the interest of context, I thought of a comparison a little closer to home. Uh, the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, uh, widely acknowledged as a resounding success, was attended by 1.3 uh, million people. Therefore, the Edinburgh Festivals is the equivalent of having their Commonwealth Games in Scotland three times a year, every year. And while it's quite right that we emphasise the economic benefits that the festival brings, there it's worth 313 million for the Scottish economy as a whole. It's as well to remember, as others have pointed out, that it was born out of idealism and not a desire for pecuniary gain. Uh, the founder of the International Festival, Rudolf Bing, wanted to use the festival, as others have said, to build bridges across a world torn apart by war. He was an Austrian-born opera impresario who, being Jewish, had to flee his homeland uh, in uh, Germany uh, to seek refuge in Britain, uh, something that we should perhaps bear in mind given some of the divisive language used today about refugees. If Sir Rudolf Bing had not found safety here, we may not be having this debate today and our country would be so much poorer both culturally and indeed financially. The first Edinburgh International Festival featured Glyndebourne Opera, the Halle Orchestra and Sadler's Wells Ballet, reflecting the interests of Bing. But even in that first year, it was, it was more than that. The, as the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned, the Edinburgh Film Guild uh, decided to run a week-long film festival, which developed into the International Film Festival. The Royal Scottish Academy extended its summer exhibition that year, meaning that visual art had a place at the festivals right from the start, uh, something that has expanded, uh, of course, in the years hence. And someone that very year had the idea of getting some pipe bands uh, to play on the Castle Explanade. Um, and that event developed into the Magnificent Tattoo, which officially began in 1950, as Gordon Lindhurst has already told us. Uh, most importantly of all, however, uh, it's as well to remind ourselves that the Festival Fringe actually began in exactly the same year as the International Festival and very much had its roots at home in the then vibrant Scottish amateur theatrical movement. Um, effectively, the theatre companies gatecrashed the party that year and they included the left of centre Glasgow Unity Theatre, which viewed the official festival as bourgeois. Uh, they wanted to connect it to the wider public and their two shows that year were Gorky's The Lower Depths and Robert McClellan's uh, The Laird of Torwat Letty. Uh, other contributors uh, to what was then called the adjunct to uh, the festival uh, were Edinburgh District Community Drama Association, who stayed The Anatomist by James Bridey at the Pleasance, uh, and also the Edinburgh People's Theatre, who put on Thunder Rock also at the Pleasance. So it was a people's festival uh, right from the very beginning. Uh, the term fringe appeared the following year in 1948, and it was first used by Robert Kemp, a journalist and playwright who was the father of the late Arnold Kemp. Uh, who went on to edit the Glasgow Herald newspaper. Uh, the tensions between the Fringe and the official festival are far less apparent these days now that we have the very successful Umbrella Festival's uh, Edinburgh organisation. But it's fair to say uh, that there was a long running debate um, over many decades about accessibility versus excellence, indigenous versus international work. Uh, that debate had an energy about it that benefited both sides. And I think the success of the Expo programme uh, that the Cabinet Secretary uh, highlighted in her speech is a very good example of that uh, creative uh, tension giving birth to something that's really good and welcomed by all. Dr Angela Barty of Edinburgh University explores this dynamic in her 2013 book, The Edinburgh Festivals. Uh, she notes that the numerous cultural wars around Edinburgh's festivals, particularly in the 50s and 60s, reflected key debates about the place of arts and society during that period. And that included debates about censorship, the role of culture as a weapon of, of enlightenment, whether it could be used for political purposes, plus the conflicts between small C, conservative and liberal, elite and diverse and traditional and avant-garde. 
these all clashed in Edinburgh each August, and it meant that Scotland was at the cutting edge of the big global intellectual arguments of the age. So today, as we celebrate their 70th birthday, it's as well to note that Edinburgh's festivals are still at the centre of international debate and the key challenges which face us today. And one of the most thought-provoking submissions to the uh, European Tourism uh, Culture and External Relations uh, inquiry on Brexit came from the Festival's Edinburgh organisation. Uh, aside from the obvious financial implications, not least to programmes such as Creative Europe, um, they pointed out to the message that Brexit set, sent out and their submission noted that it's vital that the countries of the EU and beyond continue to see Scotland as an open and outward looking nation. Uh, to that end, I was particularly pleased to see that the 70th anniversary programme this year includes the spirit of 47, uh, the co-curated programme marking the founding partnership, featuring artists, uh, from Scotland, England, the United States, Ukraine, Lebanon, Cuba, all over the world. Uh, it's a very timely celebration uh, of the depth and quality of international cultural collaboration. That was the spirit of 1947 that Rudolf Bing sought to nurture and it should also be the spirit of 2017 and beyond. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's a great pleasure to take part in uh, this debate this afternoon, not only as a uh, MSP for the Lothian region, uh, but as someone, and I think probably the first speaker, who actually grew up in Edinburgh um, and uh, went through the fringe and the festival uh, as someone as a child. And perhaps with your forbearance, President Officer, I will go down memory lane and share some of the few highlights uh, that I had. I have to say that I was brought up in a family who were not culturally that um, accessible. In fact, my father used to close his office for two weeks in August to get away from all the people in Edinburgh. However, we did manage to uh, move beyond that slightly. And I think one of the great strengths of the festivals here in Edinburgh in August is the diversity you can find uh, within it. Uh, my colleague, uh, Gordon Lindhurst, has already mentioned uh, the tattoo. And I remember just a few years ago as a young boy uh, going to the tattoo and the excitement of going to see uh, different people taking part. But perhaps the greatest excitement was right at the start of the tattoo when the person introducing it used to say, where were you from? And we would go around the world uh, of not only the Commonwealth countries, but the global. And the number of people from North America, from Asia, from Europe, was always outstanding. And I think that is one of the strengths of the whole festival, is that it brings people together from different cultures, different backgrounds, and together we can celebrate what is going on within the city. And I think if we ever lose that international feel, then the festival will be less good for it. But you can go from a grand tattoo with bands uh, playing, with shows from across the world. You can then go to the, the church hall, to the small community centre, uh, where you will see uh, different uh, performances taking place. Uh, my researcher informed me that last year, she spent two hours, and her words was brilliant life affirming, and what it was was medieval people chanting in Latin. The diversity is immense. You can have that to Gilbert and Sutherland all in one day. And I think one of the things that maybe we have slightly lost, and I think we need to look again, is how do we then tailor out to the communities um, across Edinburgh and Lothian? Uh, councillor Eric, or former councillor Eric Milligan, who was a former Lord Forest here in Edinburgh, when he was Lord Forest, deliberately took some of the best known acts into perhaps the most deprived areas of the Lovians. So, yeah. Fiona Hislop. 
The member might be interested to know that I wrote to Eric Milligan to thank him particularly for his role with the festivals and he's just stood down as being a board member of the Blues and Jazz Festival for which he was um, a great um, advocate. Um, in terms of taking the festival out, is the member familiar with the work that the Edinburgh International Festival is doing, particularly with Castle Bray High School? And that is not just a, a one-off, it's actually a, a, a sustained relationship. And also that the festivals across the year actually engage with all 32 local authorities, but perhaps uh, not everybody is aware of that outreach during the year. Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, I mean, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. I mean, I was actually just going to go on and talk about the one example that we do have at the moment. And, and I think that just needs to be done a bit more, because often the schools in Edinburgh are back by the final two weeks of the festival taking place. And there would be opportunities. I, I, I think it would be good for schools to deliberately put on um, times where children from both primary and secondary school can go and see events. Um, and we look at that and how we do that. I think the, one of the great um, developments over the last few years has been the Book Festival in Charlotte Square. And again, an opportunity to bring people from different backgrounds, um, political, historical, culturally, and to be able to meet them and talk to them. And again, I know as someone who grew up in the city, the um, inspiration I got from being able to listen to people who came from such different backgrounds talk about what they've done in their lives and how they've impacted their society. Can I conclude, uh, Deputy Vice Officer, by saying I, I think um, we do have to look towards what is going to happen over the next few years. Um, I was just elected a councillor um, in Edinburgh when the report of funding hoofs was published and came to Edinburgh City Council and to other bodies. Uh, and clearly we do have something very unique here, unique here, but other people want to steal it. Both people from other parts of the UK, other parts of Europe and other parts of the world. And I think we cannot be complacent just to think because it's always been here for all these years, that it will continue to be. Uh, and I do hope that both uh, national government, that the city council and others will seek to continue to fund what is going on. Um, Lewis MacDonald was absolutely right. Others will play their part. People do pay to come here and, and use a lot of their money. But we need to make sure that we have the appropriate support in regard to that. I think we can be very proud, not only here in Edinburgh, but as a nation, of what happens here in August. Although I have to confess, I still do look forward to the first week in September and a bit of peace and quiet on the Royal Mile. <laughs> I call Gordon MacDonald, followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary highlighted, Edinburgh festivals are the economic powerhouse of the tourism industry in Scotland. Starting with the Edinburgh International Science Festival in March, through to Edinburgh's Hug Monet, the economic impact was measured at £280 million in Edinburgh and £313 million across Scotland. The Edinburgh Festival 2015 impact study also found that 5,500 jobs were supported in Edinburgh and 6,000 6, jobs across Scotland by the 12 festivals that take place each year in the city. But it's not just the economic benefit the jobs bring to Edinburgh. Locals who took part in the survey agreed that the various festivals brought the community together and, and increased people's pride in the city. My constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands is closely associated with the military as there are three army barracks located in the area. Therefore, I'll, I'll focus on the contribution that the Edinburgh military tattoo makes to the economy of the city. The first tattoo took place in 1950 with the first overseas regiment to participate being the band of the Royal Netherlands Grenadiers in 1952 and they were joined by performers from Canada and France. Since then, sorry, I'm not wearing my usual glasses. They broke about five minutes ago. <laughs> Since then, 48 countries from across six continents have performed at the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Over 14 million people have attended the tattoo since it started, with the annual audience currently around 220,000 every August. The event is so popular that it has sold out for the last 18 consecutive years. However, 
Many people get their first taste of the tattoo by watching television, resulting in a worldwide audience every year of 100 million people. My constituency has another direct connection with the tattoo, as every year it holds the rehearsals for the event on the parade ground of Redford Barracks. It is at Redford that the close to 1,200 performers, 250 pipers, along with the military bands, come together for the first time to practice and showcase their talents. The cavalry barracks also act as home for a large proportion of the military personnel taking part in the tattoo for the duration of its August run. An assessment of the economic impact of the tattoo alone put it at £77 million to the Scottish economy. And as it is set up and run for charitable purposes, it also gifts around £8 million to service and civilian organisations. However, there is one issue that could impact on future tattoos in Edinburgh, and that is the MOD's proposal to sell off both the Redford Infantry and Cavalry Barracks in Edinburgh by 2022. If the proposal goes ahead, where will the performers be accommodated? Where is there a large enough secure area oops, and I've lost my glasses again, <laughs> that can carry out rehearsals with five other military sites also due to close, including Craigie Hall and Glencourse, making a number of army units homeless, then finding a base for the tattoo could prove to be difficult. The 12 festivals that take part in the city each year are well established, but as a, as a whole that they are viewed when people refer to Edinburgh as the world's leading festival city. By undermining the tattoo, the MOD could have an impact on the city's hard-won reputation and on the 4.5 million visitors that attend a festival each year, especially as many visitors state that the festivals are the sole or most important reason for visiting Scotland. Presiding officer, the Edinburgh Festival Impact Study found that 94% of respondents were of the view that it is festivals that make the city special. So we need to protect that which makes Edinburgh a leading international destination. And the MOD should think again about the future of Redford Barracks. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for the chance to speak in this important debate, recognising the remarkable value and worldwide significance of Edinburgh's international festivals. Like others, I am incredibly proud to have grown up in Edinburgh, to, to live in this city now, and of course to represent the vibrant and brilliant constituency of Edinburgh, Northern and Leith here in the Scottish Parliament. Edinburgh is a truly outstanding city all year round, as Deutsche Bank recently surveyed it as the, the second best place in the world for quality of life. But during August, when the Edinburgh Art Festival and Royal Military Tattoo and International Festival and Edinburgh Festival Fringe and the Edinburgh International Book Festival and so much more are alive. This place is particularly incredible. The city almost doubles in size, the streets are filled with talent from around the globe and fun, curiosity, generosity of spirit and internationalism are all around. Last year, you could not have been in this great city and not seen the Edinburgh International Festival's inspiring Welcome World campaign. Signs proclaiming those two words, Welcome World, in large, bold, purposeful letters, were attached to buildings and lampposts and bus shelters. They were on programmes and leaflets and T-shirts. That campaign was in place before the result of the EU referendum. But, presiding officer, it felt particularly poignant and on the mark in Scotland's capital city last year. It made a powerful statement that could not be ignored. And running throughout August last year, the International Festival alone welcomed 2,442 artists from 36 nations to Scotland's capital city. And in venues, bars, restaurants and business meetings, amongst the, the good feeling, there were also worrying conversations between those artists 
artists from Scotland and the wider UK and beyond, about how to keep the strength and diversity of the festival alive in the face of the Brexit challenge and its implications. Influential voices have raised concerns about possible barriers for audiences and performers coming to Edinburgh for our festivals. And it remains unclear on what travel arrangements the UK government will pursue post-Brexit. The UK government can allay these fears and I genuinely hope in, in good faith that they will do that sooner rather than later because we are now one year on. As I have said, presiding officer, the Edinburgh International Festival's Scotland Welcomes the World campaign last year was not created as a result of the EU referendum, but instead to bring the festival's founding principles to the forefront and to emphasise and celebrate the spirit of the festivals. In 1947, the founders believed that the festival could reinvigorate and enrich the cultural life of Europe and Scotland and provide a platform for a flowering of human spirit, in their words, by bringing people and artists together from around the world. The vision was that this would generate significant cultural, social and economic benefits for Edinburgh and for the whole of Scotland. And how visionary that ambition was and how enriched Edinburgh and the whole of Scotland and beyond has been as a result. As others have said, as well as the cultural benefits of participating in and attending event, events in fields such as the arts, comedy, literature, film, music and science, there's also immense economic benefit from filling beds in our hotel rooms to boosting our bars and restaurants and providing a vital source of income to wonderful venues across Edinburgh. The benefit we gain from our festivals is huge. In 2015, the economic impact for Edinburgh was an estimated 280 million and 313 million was generated for Scotland as a whole. This boosted support for jobs and businesses across a variety of sectors in our economy, from tourism to hospitality and more. And so we must all seek to protect and grow our festivals. Presiding officer, we must not forget that it is people who make the festivals possible. Not just the artists on stage, the curators and executives who work hard to produce their work. Not just the fantastic venues and shows that we all see and the interesting talks that we enjoy. But also those on the ground supporting the day-to-day -day running of the festivals. The bartenders, the cleaners, the taxi drivers, hotel staff police officers and more. And we must also remember that a great number of the individuals showcasing their work more often than not are Scotland's emerging artists, performers, producers, directors and playwrights. Our festivals can be their gateway to the world and the launch pad for their talents and their careers. And so in closing, presiding officer, let me finish by thanking and congratulating everyone who has been involved in Edinburgh's festivals over the past 70 years, from the artists to the hospitality staff. Over those 70 years, the festivals have done what they were intended and more. They have brought an incredibly diverse range of people and cultures together and enriched Scotland in many ways. They have indeed flowered the human spirit. And let's work together to make sure that we enjoy another 70 years of festivals in this great city and not take them for granted. Let's expand the reach of the festivals, for example, further into Leith. And I hope one day that Leith Theatre will once again host events for the festivals as it did so brilliantly recently in the Hidden Door Festival. And let's also expand the economic benefits, for example, working together to share more of the wealth and the cultural enrichment throughout our city. Let's do that with openness and internationalism. Let's keep our international festivals international in, in terms of all the challenges we face and continue to welcome the world to this great city. I call Alexandra Stewart to be followed by Ash Denham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to take part today in this debate and have the opportunity to speak. Having spent many years before entering this place, Deputy Presiding Officer, supporting, performing, coordinating theatrical, musical, dance and operatic events, I know only too well about the time, the talent and the commitment that is required to stage an event or festival, and I pay tribute to anyone who has embarked on this endeavour. The chance, the opportunity uh, to perform, 
to inspire an audience, uh, to unlock the potential of an artist, uh, is something that is quite remarkable and very encouraging to see. Every August in Edinburgh, the International Festival possesses the capacity to transform one of the world's most beautiful cities into a combined stage and platform for some of the best emerging and established acts across the globe. An opportunity to showcase their talent within exquisite, unique and historic surroundings of the capital of Scotland. And we are very much the envy of the world for having the location we do. The International Festival success is built on an uncompromising commitment to originality, uh, to inviting individuals uh, and creators and performers uh, to showcase their talent, their music, their theatre, their film, their dance or their opera thus offering a unique experience for the audience to feel enthusiastic, to watch the performer uh, and to participate uh, in many of uh, the events that take place. This year, however, is special. In 2017, it marks the International Festival's 70th anniversary. And that is something, Deputy Presiding Officer, we should celebrate and we should shout from the rafters. Of course, uh, what we have to come uh, to expect and recognise in the Edinburgh Festival uh, encompasses the whole host of festivals from the International Fringe and the Film Festival, which was founded back in 1947 uh, by Rudolf Bing. The whole opportunity of bringing together different types of festivals, and we've heard today already in the Chamber that uh, that has developed uh, over the years, the Royal Military to two. Uh, the Jazz and Blues Festival, the International Book Festival and the International Science Festival. This year we celebrate all of these fantastic events uh, as Edinburgh Festival from uh, one of the largest cultural opportunities that we've had and hosting over 25,000 performers creatively and, con and that will contribute to hundreds of millions of pounds and thousands of jobs to our economy and that is something that we all welcome. Indeed, the economic impact has been measured at 280 million in Edinburgh and 313 million across Scotland. What a fantastic opportunity to develop and to see uh, individuals come here, express themselves and everybody generate and understand and get something from that. And we, the Scottish Conservatives, recognise that festivals are very important. Uh, even our own manifesto uh, did quote uh, that uh, the 70th anniversary year of the Edinburgh Festival is something that we support and we want to develop the new Edinburgh Concert Hall, uh, reaffirming Edinburgh as the UK's leading festival city and a cultural beacon around the globe. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, there have been many studies and many uh, reports uh, on the festival, but one that I, I want to speak about today showed that 92% of respondents to a study said that the festival had given them the chance to see something that they would not otherwise have had the opportunity to go and support. And also these 92% uh, felt that it was a must-see event because we do bring together collaborations, individuals, organisations who want to inform and get their message over in many ways. Uh, and that's a fantastic opportunity to see collaboration from young and old, uh, from all the different factors that we've seen. And it has to be noted that, you know, 3,269 shows took place uh, within 294 venues across Edinburgh. Now that in itself is a, an immense uh, organisational structure to put together. The fringe model has been emulated from Australia to France, Canada to Prague, South Africa to Brighton, China to Brazil, and everywhere else in between, Deputy Presiding Officer. The fringe movement has grown from strength to strength, enabling people all over the world to make cultural connections and transcend national boundaries. It is only right and proper, Deputy Presiding Officer, that on the 11th of July, a global celebration of the festival is to be staged for 24 hours and will bring together the opportunities uh, of a worldwide euphoria generated by such events as St Patrick's Day and Burns Night. We want to ensure that they and we have the opportunity to be on that stage. So with more than 200 open access events as far away as Canada, South America and Australia, all expecting to unite in helping to mark uh, and make much of their Scottish roots. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, if successful, this could realistically become an annual event and would cement Edinburgh as the birthplace of the festival fringe. So, as I say, I'm delighted to have 
opportunity, the, the opportunity to participate. I'm not going to sing to you or perform to you on this occasion, but we may get some time in the future. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, if your colleagues hadn't used up that extra time, I might have been asking you to do that, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> I'm going to call on Ash Denham to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very happy to be taking part in this debate today as an Edinburgh MSP. Seven decades ago, Europe was reeling. Lives were lost, cities were destroyed, and the very meaning of humanity was almost forgotten. In the process, the art and the culture that many European nations had pioneered and were known for around the world was put on hold. Melodies were silenced as concert and opera halls were bombed. Prose was usurped by propaganda and theatres went dark for years. That is until war receded and in its aftermath, Europe looked to Edinburgh. In selecting a city for the International Festival, one of the founders, Henry Harvey Wood said, above all, it should be a city likely to embrace the opportunity and willing to make the festival a major preoccupation, not only in the city chambers, but in the heart and home of every citizen, however modest. 70 years on, and with over 2,000 artists from 40 nations, I think Edinburgh has fulfilled Henry Harvey Wood's ambition and vision. Each year in August, Scotland's capital city is filled with opera, music, theatre, dance and literature. And while the hundreds of thousands that flock here get to experience Scotland in the process, so too does Scotland get to experience the world. Of course, Edinburgh's rich culture was a draw for the festival's founders, but more so, I'd like to think that they also appreciated the friendly and welcoming nature of Scots in general. And that, I believe, is why it's so beneficial about the International Festival and its mission of the flowering of the human spirit people from all over coming together in Edinburgh and united through art and culture. And in its 70 years, the International Festival brought people together, not only through the main events in August, but by inspiring even more. So the Fringe, the International Film Festival, the Science Festival and Hogmanay to name but a few. Now Edinburgh is host to 12 major annual festivals throughout the year experienced by more than four and a half million people yearly and earning it the title of the world's festival city. And we celebrate them all today in today's motion. And I do welcome the government's 19 million pound in funding to the festival since 2008 and also that extra 300,000 pledged for the 70th anniversary year. Such achievement in world-class events would never have been possible without the leading work of the International Festival. And we owe the festival, its founders, its current staff and previous staff, volunteers, funders and audiences, a debt of gratitude. Because after all, these events contribute in so many ways to Edinburgh and to Scotland, but also economically, with £280 million in economic activity just for Edinburgh alone. The festivals also, as we've heard today, bring many visitors to Scotland. And according to the 2016 Festival Impact Study, 71% of visitors said that the festivals are the sole or the most important reason they had for visiting Scotland. I've been attending festival events since I was a child. And the first one I can remember was when my parents brought me to watch the fireworks that mark the end of the festival. And I have to confess, I still absolutely love watching the fireworks and went along last year as well. And I've also had the opportunity to start to bring my children to events at the festival. We've, um, myself and or with my children, have attended a whole different range of things from opera and concerts to experimental comedy and even just the really inventive street shows. My friends from down south absolutely love to come up and visit in August so that they can combine a visit with me with also attending something of the festival. So I would recommend the festivals very highly. There really is something for everyone and for anyone that hasn't been along to the festival, they really should consider um, attending something. So in the aftermath of war, organizations like the International Festival were born in part for the world to heal. But more significantly, 
They were born and exist still today so that humanity will, even in the most challenging of circumstances, never turn their backs on one another. Festival director Fergus Leinhen probably said it best when reflecting on the festival's 70th anniversary, saying it feels more important than ever that we celebrate those founding values of the festival and continue to welcome the world to our city. I hope we'll all continue to be inspired by the festival's creativity, both in its philosophy and also in its art. In 70 years, it's done so much for Edinburgh, for Scotland and for the world, and I'm confident that the best is still yet to come. The last of the speakers in the open debate is Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by expressing my pleasure at being able to contribute to today's debate in the Edinburgh's International Festivals? Of course, as an almost Ouija from the west, of, west coast of Scotland, it can be sometimes challenging to talk about a successful Edinburgh. However, on a serious note, it's absolutely right that we are having this debate to celebrate the sheer impact that Edinburgh's international festivals have in our communities and delivering a thriving economic and vibrant cultural scene. And it is to cultural that I want to uh, want our remarks to begin, presiding officer, as there can be no underestimating the fact that Edinburgh's festivals are world leading and are a cornerstone of Scottish culture and tourism. They have been defining and promoting Scot Scotland's identity as a confident, creative, welcoming nation for the past 70 years. Just last week in this chamber, I asked the Cabinet Secretary for Culture what the Scottish and UK Government were doing to attract major events to be hosted here in Scotland. Why? Because Scotland is a melting pot of culture and a real draw for international visit uh, visitors, with so much to showcase and so much to share. The numbers associated with events like the Edinburgh Festivals are staggering in terms of talent that the festivals attract. There are over 2,500 artists in 2016 from all over the world, from comedy to acting, art or music. A plethora of talent is on display. And in 2015, there was a combined audience of 4.5 million. That puts these festivals on par with the attendance at the FIFA World Cup and second to only the, the Olympic Games. We should be proud of our capital city that it continues to deliver not only an amazing event, but delivers for Scotland. Moving on from culture, President Officer, I'd like to highlight an important factor in the festival and its other contribution it makes to Scotland, and that is its contribution to the economy. The facts speak for themselves. Edinburgh's festival generated a total impact of 280 million in Edinburgh and 313 million in Scotland. And the good news for all of us is that the money generated from the festival has continued to grow. According to the Edinburgh Festival 2015 Impact Survey, the suite of festivals held in the capital generated 280 million for Edinburgh, 313 million for Scotland, an increase of 19% and 24% respectively since 2010. For comparison's sake, we should look at golfing tourism, where the most recent independent economic impact assessment states that it's estimated to be worth 220 million annually. That's a significant economic benefit to Scotland. Beyond finance, however, the festivals are also delivering opportunities, opportunities for employment. As we have seen in 2015, a total of 5,560 full-time equivalent jobs were created in Edinburgh and 6,021 in Scotland, compared to 5,047 and 4,757 respectively in 2010. In summing up, presiding officer, it is clear that the Edinburgh festivals not only contribute to Scotland's incredible cultural scene, but to our economic growth as a nation. I am proud that in 2017-18, 2.3 million has been allocated through the Edinburgh Festival Expo Fund by this Scottish Government, which will take the amount awarded to more than 19 million since 2008. 
I believe that this shows this SNP Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to delivering large-scale events that attract international visitors and domestic visitors alike, and says loudly and clearly our message. Scotland is open, Scotland is welcoming, and Scotland is a nation with so much to offer. In two words, we could simply say, visit Scotland. Uh, but before I move on to the closing speeches, um, may I put on record that Ms Denham has just apologised for uh, not having informed the Chamber that she is PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Ms Denham. And we now move to the closing speeches. I go to Daniel Johnson. If you could give us around six minutes, please, Mr Johnson. I shall. Well, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a really fantastic debate um, with a, a lot of uh, things that we can all agree about. And indeed, great thanks for, amongst other highlights, of the, the mental image of Gordon Lindhurst being chased down the Royal Mile by someone brandishing a pair of underpants. All, uh, and indeed, I think we can all remark on such a remarkable degree of consensus in the Chamber that practically every speaker used the line about the World Cup. Um, and in this, I don't think that that consensus can be construed as an own goal at all. My only disappointment, indeed, is, is that Alexander Stewart didn't take up his suggestion of uh, entering into a song and dance routine, which, presiding officer, I think the space in front of you, I've always thought, would be perfect for such a show. But as a, a, an MSP representing an Edinburgh constituency, indeed, somebody who grew up in the city, it's with a huge sense of pride that I'm speaking in this debate. As every speaker has mentioned, the Edinburgh festivals truly are special. For a month in August, this city of... Uh, sorry, I was getting carried away. I, I'd be delighted to. <laughs> ben McPherson. Any officer, and, and, and thank you very much, Daniel Johnson, for the intervention. Uh, just very briefly, does Mr Johnson share my disappointment that six MSPs who represent Edinburgh haven't been in today's debate or, or, or taken part in it? Daniel Johnson. Can I diplomatically suggest that they have missed out on a fantastic opportunity to talk about the great things of, uh, uh, about our great city? So I'll agree with them to that extent. Um, but, but, but for the, the month of August, this city of a mere half a million people truly welcomes the world. It becomes a much bigger city, a city full of different ideas, different uh, activities, and it's something that is truly special, something that, as I was growing up in Edinburgh, I became very aware of. So at the age of eight, I decided that I would make my own contribution to the Edinburgh Festivals by putting on an exhibition of completed jigsaws and interesting rocks from my garden, advertising it through chalk drawings on the neighbouring pavements. Like many shows in the Edinburgh Festival, I have to say it was not necessarily a commercial nor artistic success, but I do believe it was a small contribution. Um, and indeed, I think that the, the contribution that the Edinburgh Festivals make aren't merely commercial. They are much bigger than that. They are cultural, they are artistic. And I think one of the things that really, I think, uh, uh, demonstrates that is the degree to which the festival is so many different things to different people. It's comedy, it's music, it's art, it's literature. Well and truly, the, the world of the arts comes together in one place. And I think, as many speakers have mentioned, it, it really is a case that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. The fact there are so many festivals that, that seek to, to copy and, and capture some of that sense of Edinburgh festivals all around the world truly is a credit to what we have created here. And I think we should thank uh, both Fiona Hislop and my colleague Lewis MacDonald for, I think, setting out very well the history of the Edinburgh festivals. In 1947, when it was created, the world was a shattered place. And I think it is uh, and you're a true tribute to Rudolf Bing and his colleagues that, that they brought this together, especially Rudolf Bing, uh, you're somebody who'd flee uh, the, 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 the true chaos um, and uh, the unimaginable horror of the Second War, come here and do such a big thing of creating the international, international festival is, is truly amazing. Um, and I think that what we have here is, a, is an amazing combination of, of wonderful, eclectic, different uh, uh, art forms coming together. But it is also the combination of the different festivals that, that is important. Because alongside the Indra International Festival, indeed, we had the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, which was a, a truly open fringe, welcome to all, bringing all who wanted to uh, come and create and contribute. Um, and I think it's that combination of curation of the very best that the world has to offer, along with that openness and creativity that is important. 
But I'd also just like to welcome Ben McPherson's contribution. So I think he made a very important point, because I think those lessons are very true and very important today. We are living in a time when the world seems to be on the brink of, of drawing in, going in on itself. And I think that that spirit that the, the festival sought to bring to the world is one that we need to consider and, and look to. And I think that the Edinburgh festivals can continue to make that kind of contribution as we go forward. Because what we have here is of global significance. People around the world know Edinburgh because of how important the, the Edinburgh festivals are and the cult cultural contribution that they make. But that contribution is also something that's very important to Scotland. A, a good number of speakers talked about that economic contribution, contributing around £300 million to the economy. And I think that is important. But it is also something which I think is important because it gives us an opportunity in Edinburgh and in Scotland to give something back to the world. And I think that's always very apparent when you talk to people from other countries who know about Edinburgh, about what's going on here, and about the specialness of what happens in Edinburgh in International Festivals, that it is a fantastic thing that we are able to do, that contribution to the world that we make through those Edinburgh International Festivals. But I would also just like to comment on the, 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 the points made by both Jeremy Balfour and Joan McAlpine about the importance of maintaining that openness, and especially that openness to communities here in Edinburgh. I mean, at times, the, the arts can be precious, they can be closed off. And I think one of the important things about the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in particular was that it was meant to be about openness. So we must make sure that we continue to uh, uh, preserve that openness, both to people who want to contribute in terms of uh, making their contributions to, to, to the art and performance, but also those people who want to attend. We must make sure the Edinburgh Festivals are open to all, both artists and people who want to uh, be uh, audiences. And while this is a debate about which we can agree on a great deal, I do just need to gently bring up the fact that arts do need support. And while I very much welcome the restoration of the Exposition Fund, we must note that the City of Edinburgh Council contributes £9 million to the Edinburgh Festival. And given the government pressures, we do have to be concerned about this. So I would urge the government to make sure that it does continue to support the arts because they do need supported. So in conclusion, I think the festivals contribute a great deal both to Scotland and to the world. It's something that we have a great deal to be proud of, and I think that we should all continue to support them and the great work that the Edinburgh Festivals do. Thank you. I now call Jackson Carlow around seven minutes, please, Mr Carlow. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I say it's a great pleasure to contribute to this debate. I am, along with Patrick Harvey, myself a best-selling fringe box office success from a previous Edinburgh Festival, a sell-out audience of 600 people. I think you'll agree we were the parliamentary Pete Cook and Dudley Moore of this event. I should say it was actually probably more owing to the success of the comedian Mark Thomas, who was holding one of his People's Manifesto events. But nonetheless, we expected a television series to follow. We were sadly to be disappointed in that. Uh, it only, I, should, I think, points to the hugely competitive nature of uh, the bid for venues at the, at the festival. Um, I, I do want to pay tribute to, to Rudolf Bing. He is a hero of the Jewish community, of whom uh, the greatest number live in my Eastwood constituents. He was born in Vienna in 1902. He lived to the grand old age of 95, dying in, uh, dying in New York 20 years ago, and was knighted in, in 1971. He, he was born and brought up in Vienna and moved to Berlin in 1927. And, and he wasn't actually a refugee, as, as Joan McAlpine suggested. He did actually consciously move here, certainly uh, becoming very aware of the rise of Hitler and Nazi Germany, uh, but left very much at the start of all of that uh, to become work, to work at the Glyndebourne uh, from the summer of 1934. And he was the manager of Glyndebourne, in fact, from 36 through to 1939, uh, when, of course, the uh, house closed during the hostilities themselves, but was there afterwards to reopen Glyndebourne in the immediate uh, period after the war. And, and it was he, along with others, but he too, who had the vision of the festival. And I have to say, Edinburgh wasn't the first choice. Uh, he actually wanted to start the festival in Oxford, uh, but in fact, when they weren't able to make progress in Oxford, he had to scout around for another venue and for the most parochial of reasons settled on Edinburgh. Why? Because he liked the castle. Uh, the castle reminded him of Salzburg Castle uh, in his uh, native Vienna. And of course, Salzburg had its own musical festival, most familiar to most of us, I think, from the Von Trapp family singers in that classic conclusion to the film The Sound of Music. But it was for that reason that, that the castle reminded him, and crucially too, 
the practical contribution that Edinburgh could make because it hadn't had the same carpet bombing that many other cities had had in the war. And so there was the ready availability of potentially 100,000 beds for tourists and artists who might want to visit the festival. And so for those reasons, he settled on uh, Edinburgh. Um, it was a difficult sell. Uh, in that first year, he managed to attract the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, conducted by Bruno Walter, and, and that had a huge impact in terms of giving credibility. It, you know, he said himself that many people were skeptical across Europe about whether they should bring their talent to Edinburgh. They, they looked, some of them didn't even know what it was. Uh, you know, it was a much more parochial era. Um, but he, he began to make success with that, and he himself said, um, you know, if you contemplate the, the structure of the arts in this country at the time, uh, he said it could be encapsulated by comparing the number of opera houses that were present on the continent at that time compared to the United Kingdom. And the message that this sent to artists that perhaps Britain really wasn't somewhere they should come to uh, to advance their career. There were, in fact, some 80 opera houses across the continent of Europe. There were only two in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, and one of them was regarded at that stage as being somewhat parochial and, and not terribly uh, 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 celebrated uh, or, or having standards that really rose to the occasion. So actually bringing all of those arts companies to Edinburgh was a major achievement. And Edinburgh itself actually became an inspiration for the development of the arts across the whole of the United Kingdom. So for all that we've talked today about the remarkable contribution it's made to cultural life in Scotland, the Edinburgh Festival in those post-war years made an enormous contribution to arts across the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, we've heard some excellent speeches this afternoon. Uh, Joan McAlpine might be concerned to know that I actually agree that there are challenges presented by Brexit. I hope they prove to prove to be at the margin, but there will be funding challenges, as there has clearly been support funding from there. Jeremy Balfour took us on some of his childhood nostalgia. In the great tradition of Norman Wisdom and Eric Sykes, God MacDonald used a prop to entertain us through <laughs> his own speech. We heard from Ben Whitpherson, Alexander Stewart told us that he did a previous career in musical theatre. Who knew? Who suspected? I can only say, presiding officer, that he will be compulsorily auditioned. Uh, and if, in fact, I think there's any mileage in it, then I will cut short a future speech in order to give him that final opportunity. We heard from the uh, convener of the Showman's Guild. I think that was probably the cultural aspect that Richard Lyle brought to the debate as he, as he talked about it. We heard from Daniel Johnson that his own showmanship, which I've often paid tribute to in this, he and uh, 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 Mr. Cole Hamilton and Jamie Green, I've always thought the three great new theatrical performers of this chamber, we all began with his completed jigsaws. Uh, in Edinburgh as he sought to, as he sought to embark upon a, a, a thespian, thespian career. But uh, last year, um, it was a great pleasure, and I've come to the festival that many people have for years, and I, I hope Ben McPherson doesn't mind. I do so as somebody from the West Coast. I, mean, I hope that doesn't preclude me from participating. Uh, and last year, I, I attended one of the concerts was uh, hosted by the comedian Barry Humphreys, and it was the lost music from the Weimar Republic. And it was incredibly profound. This was music that he discovered in a second-hand bookshop in a battered briefcase. Compositions from artists, many of whom themselves had not escaped from Nazi Germany and were dead. Music that had not been performed since Hitler had banned it from the cabaret years of that republic, which he had brought back to life, had reorchestrated and performed. And if we look to the Jewish cultural heritage of Rudolf Bingen, we think that last year that concert took place. I thought it was a, a nice circular uh, event to celebrate. I, I do want to just conclude, having tried to be upbeat, with one cautionary note, and I'm interested to know what the Cabinet Secretary has to say about this. This has been a troubled year. Uh, we understand and we have seen some pretty shocking events in the rest of the United Kingdom. People will want to know they're safe when they come to the Edinburgh Festival uh, this year. Uh, and we know that by its very nature, it is an event which draws a huge international community to the city, but it's incredibly open. It takes place in the most extraordinarily diverse venues. Uh, I don't think any of us can be anything other than alert to the concerns people might have, and I think it's very important 
that we send a message out from Edinburgh that we will be doing everything we can to ensure that this festival is every bit as successful, every bit as safe, every bit as enjoyable, every bit as participative as any that has gone before it, and that we are able to say that the 70th Edinburgh Festival and all the other festivals, including our own Festival of Politics, being in the corporate body, I've seen the programme, it's stuffed full of some really big acts this year, so it comes later in the year, but all of these festivals bring people to Edinburgh and are a huge continued success. I call on Fiona Hislop to wind up this debate. If you could take us up to five o'clock, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, we started the debate hearing from Gordon Lindhurst about the melee of the advocates and the artists at the top of the Royal Mile. I, my confession is when I came to the festival when I was 14 years old, uh, myself and my friend ended up in a Scientologist recruitment uh, session thinking it was actually a fringe show. <laughs> but uh, also one of my earliest memories was getting on a bus and coming from Ayrshire to go to the, the military tattoo. And the experience of, of that has stayed with me a, a long time indeed. Um, in terms of uh, the passion that there are, is for the, the Edinburgh Festival, it's not just because it happens in Edinburgh. It does happen in Edinburgh, and I think Ash Denham is a, an Edinburgh MSP, set out why the city itself um, is so well disposed and has developed over the years to embrace the festival. But I must impress the international reputation of the Edinburgh festivals as a calling card for this country is something that other countries are hugely envious of. And it tells the world something about our country, our creativity, our innovation, um, and also our enlightenment as well. I thought Joe McAlpine in particular was talking about, I think, the intellectual challenges that have existed across the years of the festivals. And that's very, very important. And it's taken shape in different times, whether it's about um, conservatism and whether it's about uh, different ideas coming to the fore. I think we now see with the Edinburgh Book Festival, a cafe culture where clearly the, the moments and the issues of the day are being debated. And perhaps that is where we find today perhaps that intellectual powerhouse that has been the tradition right throughout the years. Lewis MacDonald uh, talked about the importance of the internationalism and he said the best answer to barbarism is to celebrate civilization and we absolutely will in reflection to the latter points um, uh, particularly from Jackson Carlo yes we want to make sure that people are safe yes we want to be open for business and yes, we want to make sure that, that reassurance is extended. And indeed, Michael Masterson, the Justice Secretary, uh, had a visit particularly last year because obviously this is not, the threats are not just recent. And we have been very conscious over a number of years of how either within venues or other means to make sure that the security um, is there. But in terms of uh, the commitment that we have, there is a consensus across the chambers of the value of the Edinburgh International Festivals, how important they are, the joy they bring, and the impact in the economic sphere as well. And I want to commend all those who work tirelessly across all the festivals. This year, the First Minister will host a reception to recognise and personally thank those who work tirelessly behind the scenes, instrumental to the success success of the Edinburgh Festival. So there are volunteers, the box office staff, technicians, joiners, so many more that go unseen. And there will be celebrations this year, particularly around the momentous 70th anniversary. Um, and they need to still push boundaries in so many different ways. And the reinvention of the festivals, uh, either in the place they are, but also in the content. And again, congratulations to the Scottish Parliament presiding officer for getting in on the act with the Festival of Politics. Ben McPherson talked about the importance of the generosity of spirit. I was a bit worried from Richard Lyle with that generosity of spirit was originally going to be extended to, to, to the, the, the Luigi confession, but he, again, uh, Richard Lyle talked about the importance of events. But Ben McPherson uh, talked about the Leith Theatre, and we also need to recognise that, of course, Summer Hall has now become a new venue, and the actual places that the festival takes place in are very important. Gordon MacDonald uh, brought a very important constituency issue uh, in, in relation to the future of the barracks and the implications for the tattoo. I would also uh, alert all those that have contributed to the debate so far, uh, the Stuarts, the McPhersons, the McDonalds and perhaps the McAlpines, that in this year of history, heritage and archaeology, there's going to be a splash of tartan at the Royal Military Tattoo, uh, where different clans, two different clans, will parade each night. So I'm not sure if you've already been recruited, but perhaps there may be an opportunity as you go forward. But in terms of uh, the festivals themselves, 
Uh, the founding festivals uh, we've talked about, but the other significant festivals grew uh, as a result of that. In the 1950s, um, we had the first military tattoo at the Edinburgh Castle Esplanade. The jazz community led the way and developed the first jazz festival in 1978, taking place in the Adelphi Ballroom in Abbey Hill, and they now, of course, encompass uh, blues and jazz. The book festival uh, emerged in 1983, and it remains in its original spot in Charlotte Square and continues to welcome writers from the around the world to share ideas and debate the power of the written word. And I understand uh, it disturbed the First Minister in Butte House from time to time as well. The first woman in space, uh, Valentina uh, Tereshkova, arrived in Edinburgh in 1989 to inaugurate the world's uh, first science festival. Uh, this year, they attracted 146,000 attendances reaching a, a wider reach of 350,000. In the same year, uh, communities were instrumental in setting up the International Storytelling Festival. Originally welcoming 700 attendees, it's now grown to 23,000. And of course, the Edinburgh International Children's Festival started in 1990. Uh, this year, they had 10,000 delegates, including schools, 300 international delegates from 23 countries. And in my visit to Japan, there's a real recognition of the value and indeed um, the status of our uh, children's festival. And of course, the world famous Hogmanay emerged next in 1994. Those of us who lived in Edinburgh before 1994 perhaps might have remembered how easy it was to get to the Tron before the 1994 uh, Hogmanay explosion. But of course, now we get 75,000 people uh, into the city. And of course, 10 years on, the Edinburgh, Inter uh, Edinburgh uh, International Art Festival, um, uh, which was founded in 2004, now has an estimated 172,000 visitors. And importantly, is ex ex helping people explain um, the city to themselves, to explore lanes and buildings, to be wowed by high quality visual art. And perhaps Daniel Johnson might want to, to, to dust off his uh, early, early work and see whether he can get in on the acts and perhaps perhaps uh, demonstrate uh, the, 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 the creativity that is renowned in this chamber as well. But of course, the alumni of the festivals, the artists themselves are extensive and illustrious. Uh, early audiences were treated to the works of pioneer animator Norman McLaren at the film festival, uh, which also established the profile and reputation of Ingmar Bergman in the late 50s. Uh, the, the, we also saw uh, Jonathan Miller, Alan Bennett, Dudley Moore and Peter Cook creating comic mayhem in the 1960s and of course that was the same decade as the Traverse was established by John Calder, Jim Haynes and Ricky DeMarco and of course Ricky DeMarco uh, bringing Macbeth to Inchcomb Island but also really importantly bringing artists from behind the Iron Curtain to absolutely exhibit their art to make sure and extend the point made by Lewis MacDonald that extending beyond boundaries is what arts and culture can do, perhaps where others can't. Could Robin you Shanker give me a moment, appears... please, Cabinet Secretary, could I ask for a bit of quiet around the chamber, please, and no private conversations? Thank you. Of course, we had Ravi Shankar in the 70s and 2011. And of course, the number of writers and performers that started on the fringe that are now so well known, Rowan Atkinson, Joe Brand and Ben Elson. And of course, more recently, we've had Juliet Binoche and our homegrown uh, Nicola Bernadetti and Alan Cumming. So that only scratches the surface of the quality and variety that the festivals bring. Of course, they continue to thrill and entertain us, to make us feel outrage or empathy, uh, perhaps bring a tear to our eye, to educate, stimulate, uh, stimulate us, or perhaps be quite provocative themselves. But they are the lifeblood and a foundation of our culture and heritage. But they are also so important, yes, to our economy, but at a time when the world is facing so many challenges, uh, the thoughts, the ideas, the expressions of our sheer humanity that are celebrated in our Edinburgh international festivals are something that we should very much be proud of. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we've had such a consensus today, but also I recognising the genuine passion and commitment that people have to the importance of Edinburgh festivals. And I hope and encourage all of you, if you've not already booked your tickets, to make sure and join us in the celebration that will take place right across the summer period. Uh, we have the Edinburgh Film Festival starting next week and in this year, the 70th year 
I hope all of us will join together to pay tribute to those that had the vision at the start, Rudolf Bing and others, but those that carry the torch of that humanity of expression that is their festivals as they celebrate their 70th years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Edinburgh's international festivals. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 6127 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme for next Tuesday. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I put the question... Sorry, I'll call on Joe Fitzpatrick first to move motion 6127. OK, uh, moved on behalf of the Bureau. Thank you. And no member is asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 6127 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are, thank you. We turn now to decision time. And there are three questions to be put. The first question is that amendment 6073.1 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst, which seeks to amend motion 6073 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Edinburgh's international festivals be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 6073.2 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fiona Hislop, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that Motion 6073 in the name of Fiona Hislop, as amended, on recognise and celebrate Edinburgh's international festivals in their 70th anniversary year, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.